so welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming out. My name is Amanda B. Johnson. Uh, I am the host and the writer of a YouTube series, a weekly YouTube series called Dash Detailed. You may have found a card on your seat when you came in. That's, that's my business card. I'm here with my partner Pete. He does our video production. And I am here to give you an introduction to Dash. And I think the best way to do that is to tell you why I work for Dash. So I became introduced to cryptocurrency, I would say early 2013. Um, at the time, I was wicked interested in money. Like the thing that, I didn't mean for that to be funny at all. <laughs> the thing like, um, that we all use, not only every day, but potentially several times a day, but maybe not all of us know where it comes from. It's certainly not talked about very often where money comes from, who makes it, what goes into it all. And, and so I was interested in money and, and I, would, I was reading up, I guess, on economics. Um, I don't, my background is not in computers, not in coding. Uh, I went to theater school. And, um, and when I first heard of cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, um, I, was, I was like a PR blogger as my day job. Um, and I was introduced to Bitcoin in particular by a guy named Jeffrey Tucker. I don't know if you've heard of him. Um, he works at the Foundation for Economic... Yeah. Oh, he spoke here! Okay, so yes, a man who spoke here named Jeffrey Tucker um, was the person who introduced me to Bitcoin. Uh, he actually sent me some via Skype. He was like, install this app. It's called blockchain.info. You'll find it in the app store. Once you've installed it, hold that code up onto the Skype screen and I'll send you magic internet money. <laughs> yeah, and so, so that was my first interaction with all of that. And I found it um, intimidating, actually. Um, he sent me a quarter of a Bitcoin, which at the time was about enough for a t-shirt. He encouraged me to buy a t-shirt with it if I could. And I didn't touch that app for, I would say, probably six months because it was so foreign to me. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know how Bitcoin worked. I didn't know if like maybe I pushed the wrong button, maybe I would break the Bitcoin and it would all have been for naught. I didn't know. And, and it was the not knowing and also the, <laughs> this guy Jeffrey Tucker put a lot of faith in me because a few months later he was like, I'm going to make a presentation in Las Vegas about Bitcoin and I'd like you to be a co-panelist. <laughs> and so I was like, what is Bitcoin? <laughs> and yeah, and so like I watched through the Khan Academy series and then that guy, uh, I forget his first name, but his last name is D'Angelo. He like makes these um, marker board series on YouTube. And so I just studied, studied, studied and lo and behold, my interest, not in computers, but in money and where it comes from and how it causes people to behave depending on its properties, was ignited. And so from there, I went on to actually begin writing at Bitcoin Magazine and then Cointelegraph and then Bitcoin.com and Bitcoinist. And I am so interested in currency competition because the whole point of competition is, is to see what's best, to see what pulls forward in the race. And this whole digital currency thing is like allowing us to view and even participate like us lowlies before who weren't able to participate in currency competition are now able to. And that just floors me. And what's more is that it's all open. It's all open source. So you know, you know how much currency units are being created in blockchain A versus how many in blockchain B. And you can see the results when you compare the two. It's very interesting. So I went on to start with my partner, Pete, um, a, a YouTube series called The Daily Decrypt. And we talked about all sorts of digital currencies on that show. Uh, it ran for about seven months. 
And it was in reporting all of these findings every day that I began to be like, that, that dash, wow, they are just like doing things right. And they are just doing like right thing after right thing after right thing. And after a while, just like almost every day, like planning our episode, I was like, I just want to talk about Dash today. I wonder if there's a way that I could work for Dash only. And so long story short, here I am doing just that. And I want to share with you why uh, I made that choice, what it is that is really u very unique about Dash. So you hear a lot about um, blockchain apps, like smart contracts and embedding uh, university degrees on blockchains to stop degree fraud, and, and embedding property titles in Africa on the blockchain, and um, oh, medical records on the blockchain. You hear about all sorts of things, and people get real excited about these sorts of apps. And whether or not they ever come to pass remains to be seen. If they do, they will not only want to, but they will have to exist on the world's most, or one of the world's most resilient blockchains, uh, secure blockchains, immutable blockchains, reliable blockchains, and so then that just leaves the question, like, how does a blockchain become secure? What makes it resilient? Um, and coming from my interest in money and economics, I have asked myself this question. And in the medium to certainly the long term, I believe that the blockchain, which will be the go-to, uh, will be the one whose payout whose block reward is already seen as money. Not one that is a not money that then has to be converted into money to pay the rent or the mortgage or pay for the groceries, but rather the one in which the block reward, the base unit, is already money. <coughs> and so the competition is on because that is a status that has not yet been reached by any blockchain. The, the, the units of account on, on it, no blockchain are yet widely regarded anywhere and everywhere as money. That is an app that has yet to be achieved before any of the other ones could possibly come into play. And I like Dash because Dash is aiming to be a digital cash. The first digital cash, really. Um, as a, as a quick comparison to Bitcoin, in case you're not familiar with it, um, Dash has a Bitcoin code base. Uh, our primary differentiators in terms of functionality are two functions. One is called private send, one is called instant send. Private send allows those who would like to, to join in a peer-to-peer -peer level coin mixing so that coins can be eliminated of their history of where they have been up until that point. Basically achieving fungibility, if that's important to you. The second function, instant send, uh, is, is going to be key for retail payments in that it can provide a confirmation on an average of about 1.3 seconds. It's even zippy, zippier than credit cards. And I hear that credit cards, by the way, now that they have those chips in them, take even longer. Yeah, I don't know. I don't have a bank account anymore. But yeah, like I see people standing in line in front of me and they're like waiting for this chip to read or something. And I'm just like thinking to myself, like, I'm going to get you with evolution. Yes. <laughs> but before we can hope to be digital cash, before we can really hope to knock out the currency app, there has to be a foundation. And it is the foundation that I'm about to tell you about that is what sets Dash apart the most, in my opinion. I see there as being two parts to this foundation. The first part is who gets to make decisions when no one is in charge? It's actually a huge deal. Uh, it's a deal that has been totally ripping apart Bitcoin for over two years now. 
Uh, it is a deal that caused Ethereum to fork into two surviving chains. Who gets to make the decisions when nobody is actually in charge? In other words, governance. Uh, Dash has found a lovely solution to the problem of governance, which is, well, who is best suited to make decisions? The people best suited to make decisions, I would say, are the people who stand to gain the most from wise decisions and stand to lose the most from bad decisions. In other words, stakeholders. But who are the stakeholders? I mean, you, if you see how a lot of these things in other networks are debated, I mean, you go on like Reddit or whatever, and it's just flame wars and, and people, and people, you know, like putting out opinions and things, and then you have other people making posts saying, well, I checked this subreddit's history, and they really came to us from the Bitcoin subreddit. They're here to sabotage us, and they may or may not be, but that's just the thing about having billion dollar debates on Reddit is that you don't know who you're talking to. You don't know where these people come from. You don't know if they own a Bitcoin or an Ether or a Dash. How could one possibly have a billion dollar debate over Reddit? And so that's not how Dash does it. In Dash, if one owns 1,000 Dash, one can lock it into what is called a master node and prove that one owns that 1,000 Dash cryptographically on the blockchain, and from henceforth, one is basically a member of Dash's board of governors. And you get a vote. You get a cryptographically recorded vote on how the currency evolves. And that's just one half of the foundation, because the other half is, OK, so just so we vote on things doesn't mean that they happen. We could vote that, I don't Joe Smith from Arkansas, like, come develop for Dash. It doesn't mean that he's going to. Like, blockchains don't compel human action. So how, how, how can we possibly incentivize human action? Well, the answer is incentives. Dash's block reward is not entirely consumed by just one of its employee classes, miners. So we have lots of employees. We have full nodes, the master nodes, who perform private send and instant send functions. We have developers. We have marketers. We have wallet designers. Uh, uh, we, we have web developers. Like, who's going to pay all of these people? You, you've seen other stabs at this in other coin networks. There's, there what, I'm sorry, not there is. There was the Bitcoin Foundation, and then it went bankrupt. Surprise, foundations don't have products to sell, hence they don't always have viable business models. Uh, the, the Ethereum Foundation, people are like all in arms uh, fighting over that. Like, like, what coins do they really hold and whose side are they really on? Maybe they'll remain solvent, maybe they won't. And, and, and in many other networks you see, it's, it's just like the donation model. Someone will make a post on Reddit and be like, hey, I'm, I'm d d uh, developing this new wallet that you all know that we really need and you've all been asking for and that we really want. Will you chip in? Will you fund it? All of these things can work for a time, but not for a decentralized autonomous organization that hopes to be a world-class resilient blockchain for the indefinite future. And so that is the other half of Dash's foundation, which is that we are self-funding. We split our revenue stream. We split our block reward among everyone who works for us. So with that pretty sturdy foundation locked down, thank heavens, good job, Evan, uh, we can uh, now, only now, say, okay, it's time for digital cash. It's time to get that currency app. And that in Dash is called Evolution. And that is a product that we are going to release late next year. And I have dubbed it the digital currency that, yes, even your mother could use. And I got that idea because Evan got the idea while he was sitting down next to his mother using the Dash Core wallet with her and like watching her reactions 
as she's using or trying to use cryptocurrency. And like every reaction she had just proved what should have been obvious all along, which is that if it doesn't look like PayPal and Venmo and feel like PayPal and Venmo, then it's not going to get the customer base of PayPal and Venmo. And so that is what evolution intends to do. And so to describe that to you is founder and lead developer of Evan Duffield. Uh, he will speak to you after I switch this microphone to him. And then after he is finished, uh, I will rejoin him for a brief question and answer session afterward, should you have any remaining questions for us. So without further ado, thank you. And here's Evan Duffield. Hello, thank you for coming out. It's, uh, it was interesting. Uh, early on when I was uh, talking to the, the organizer, uh, I, I was asked just to make a, a video and I was thinking, you know, why make a video when we can fund the trip out here and put on a show? Which, you know, this is funded completely by the blockchain, 100%. So our airfare, the hotel fare, uh, Amanda's airfare and hotel fare. So, you know, it, it just shows it's a pretty powerful system. And it's, when, when utilized correctly, you can reach people that wouldn't have otherwise been able to be reached. And so, um, I'm gonna talk about the, the next step of it, which is, what, what are we building? Now that we've kind of figured out how to, how to do the, the foundational components, how do you take that and how do you make a product with it? So, what is Dash? Uh, we are a working DAO, so a centralized autonomous organization. Um, I believe we were the first one, but I'm not entirely sure of that. Uh, these basically are theoretical types of, of corporations where they're, they're ran completely digitally. There's, there's no um, LLC or a corporation or anything like that. And they, they run um, usually by, by some sort of organizational model. And so we, we picked an organizational model similar, similar to uh, you know, what you would find with a regular incorporation. So we chose to, to try to mimic what works in the real world rather than just inventing something wholly new. We're also uh, interested in uh, user-oriented features like evolution. We, we want to make this as friendly as possible and we, we want to make it in, in such a way that anyone can use it. Uh, we, we are also uh, about $90 million market cap, 15,000 uh, users. The project's three years old. We have uh, about 120 volunteers active right now, uh, 600 uh, active community members on, on the forums with, uh, in, in, in our, our full user base. So uh, the, the project's going, going well, and we're like, really excited about it. So why, why Dash? I think the organizational model is really important. You can imagine Dash as an uh, overarching network. It's, uh, you can't divide it up, and it's not really an entity. It just holds other entities. And, and then you can think of the, there's a core Dash DAO, which, uh, I'm a part of. Amanda's actually not a part of that. She's part of our, our YouTube DAO. And so just like you could with uh, you know, Ethereum, you can make DAOs within our ecosystem and then you can ask for funding as long as you're doing something for the benefit of the network. And this is all funded from the blockchain. So we, we utilize an interesting voting mechanism that I'll, I'll talk about later. And then those votes are tallied and these blocks are created to, to pay out exactly what the network wanted. And a, as we were saying earlier, the, the, the main bread and butter of, of what we're doing is instant transactions and user privacy. And the, the privacy is really important for fungibility's sake. Uh, and what that means is that with, with a digital token, even more so than a physical token, you do not want to hold the history of the last hundred people who had the token that you now hold. Um, we might be okay with that, but normal everyday people, once they see that first person on the news, 
that gets arrested or gets their coin seized for having laundered money or any, any association with criminal activity, it's going to cause issues for the entire network. And that, that's not something we want. We want to be able to run this thing for years and years and years and uh, not have uh, people uh, concerned about the actions of others on the network. So the decentralized infrastructure. We've kind of already went over fungibility, transactions. The decentralized infrastructure is one of the, the most interesting parts as well. It's, it's the master node network, as we call it. So anyone can um, get a piece of this network. They can, uh, they, they can host a node for us. So imagine a PayPal. <laughs> And, and this is kind of what, what I do when, when trying to design these features. I take something that, that's in existence and I, I, I try to figure out how would you do that using only decentralized technology. So with a decentralized PayPal, you, you need thousands of servers to support what the users are doing on the network. And you don't want to pay for that yourself. You, you don't want to hold the infrastructure yourself. And so you, you need some mechanism to allow other people to do it for you. And that's essentially what this is. It allows anyone on the network to participate in hosting our own infrastructure. And this is how we do decentralized decision making. So this is a pretty good uh, visualization of, of how it works. You can have master nodes all over the world and then you, you have proposals that come on to the network. Uh, they, they can be presented by anyone on the network. And they could be for anything you can think of. Like, let's make a, a new type of wallet. Uh, and you know, for this new wallet, we're going to need uh, some, some uh, mock-ups. We're going to need designers. We're going to need uh, programmers. And then you can itemize that out. Put it, put it all on the blockchain and then have everybody vote on it. And then you'll see votes coming in from literally all over the network. And then you tally those up and, and then the, the funds are then allocated from that. The allocation is an interesting in a way that it's just completely different from anything else in the space. With Bitcoin, you have 100% of the block reward going to network security. And so that was the first thing we changed. We decided to split it so that security would get 45%, infrastructure would get 45%, so that's the master node network, and then project funding would get 10%. So that the infrastructure is, is what is actually voting, and then the, the project funding is then signaled from them. But it, it doesn't account for you know, um, that much money right now. It's only 10%, although even at just 10% of the, the emitted coins, we're at $1.2 million a year in funding. And you can, you can think of this in a completely a, a different way than, than you would think of like a normal start. With a, an ICO or a corporation, seed funding, you start by getting money up front. And you would say, I need, $10 million and I'll give you half of the company. We have no collateral to give and um, we, we don't want to centralize a, around a single funding source. So the, the alternative to uh, taking money up front is emitting money by the blockchain and then as you make good decisions hopefully they actually um, increase the value of everyone's holdings, and then we actually have more money to spend month to month. And so our success actually uh, will uh, add to the, the future revenue that we're able to spend. And the inverse is if we make a mistake, it draws a, a little bit of the funding down, and we can correct. So you'll see uh, a curve go up. As, as we get more successful and as we start to acquire users, that number will actually go up and then we'll be able to build branch offices and 
hire more people, fund the foundations better, uh, and, and do all of the things that you know PayPal is doing. This is essentially the seeding phase of the project. We're just at the, the very start of it. We don't even really have a project yet, or a product yet. We have a, about a half done uh, implementation of the Evolution Wallet. And so what, what we plan on doing is uh, implementing the rest of this, rolling out these features to, to everyone uh, next year, and then we should have a, a good deal more money to work with, and then we can start introducing the features that everyone's used to, like walking into an office and talking to somebody. The, the neat thing about that is that um, everyone's used to doing it, and we, we want to make everybody feel comfortable with the technology in a way that they're probably not with the, the existing implementations of, of all of these, these blockchain technologies. So the 10% is divided up. And like I was saying earlier, there's these separate DAOs. So there's the core DAO, and we, we probably take about 80% of the funding currently. But then there's a few other DAOs, and anyone can start one of these. The, what they do is they provide some sort of um, some sort of needed feature, some sort of, of needed information, or something the users need to expand the ecosystem or provide for our uh, the the services that, that we provide. And so anyone can actually start these. This, this is actually how we're, we're planning on, on drawing in more interest on the business side of it. Imagine we start branch offices eventually and we need to hire uh, tellers. Now there's, there's gonna be somebody that maybe wants to run a branch office for us. They become a DAO and then they can pay their, their staff directly from this project funding. And then what we do is we would, we would run these companies as not-for-profits. So this is a completely different model that's never been tried before. Imagine trying to compete with a series of not-for-profits that run a bank all around the world. And we're, we're literally running it based off of the blockchain funding. And we don't care if we make money. That's the thing, we just wanna provide a good service. If you think the product is good, then you'll invest within it, right? So that's that's how the investors make money off of it. It's not about selling the profits of, of actually doing business later on. The uh, project funding has grown exponentially since we introduced it. It started out at $13,000 a month, which was great. It was, uh, it was about $13,000 more money than we had at the time. And you know that that led us to being able to uh, start uh, paying people the the, um, the the volunteers that were doing a lot of the work, and they they were just extremely happy just to receive a couple hundred dollars for, for helping us, and so that led to a lot more work, and then the the quality of work increased, and and that's been um, you know going over and over again. We've had about twenty percent per month in, in added revenue through this system. And we, we just reached $100,000 a month of funding. So it does seem to be working. It seems to be working really well for, for what we're doing. So now, now that we've kind of established how, how we operate, how it works, what we're doing, what is Dash Evolution and how does it work? Why, why should we all be interested in it? So again, it's a, it's a system your mother could use, but it's, it's also something that will provide a competition to PayPal, particularly um, the API side. Uh, money as a service is, uh, I, I think, a, a new concept. And what we wanna do is provide APIs where you can hit a collection of master nodes and they will validate requests. They, they will tell you, um, 
you know, how much money is in this wallet or you know, which chain is the, the best one to be on. Anything that the users need to, to run these wallets will be provided by, via these, these APIs. And what that means is that we can actually start building a service where you, you could click a button on a website and you buy something. And that website will just have to drop a little bit of code, just like, like you do with PayPal. And that code hits the master node network in a completely random, decentralized way. And then uh, you, you can do you know, anything you could think of, of doing with, with PayPal, you know, with our system. In the, the, the whole, the whole approach here is, is to make it as mobile friendly as possible. We want everything accessible from there. So we want you to be able to go log in, send instantly to your friends, send via email, privately send to your friends. So you'll have a, a, um, a public balance, which is semi-anonymous, and then you could move money to your cash account, and you could send money from there completely anonymously. And you also have access to, you know, if you have master nodes, you would have access to that, and you know, literally all of the other features, along with chat and, and some other, some other things like that. So, you know, what we're trying to do is, if you take all of the green boxes from PayPal and the green box from Bitcoin, we're combining these two things together, and we're really not trying to compete against Bitcoin. Bitcoin's just not doing what we're trying to do. And you know, I, I thought originally this, this was probably you know, what is needed in the space to, to bring this to mass adoption. And since no one else is interested in doing it, we thought you know, we might as well try it. Whereas uh, Bitcoin will reach this, but it, it'll reach it by using centralized companies. Uh, centralized companies provide all of the services that the users utilize. and. Uh, the Bitcoin developers and the Bitcoin protocol is just a protocol. And that's what it was intended to do. And so what we intend to do is build the protocol and be the apple of crypto. And we, we plan on making a, a suite of tools where you can log on to your, your laptop, you can log on to your phone, you can log anywhere and you'll see the, the, same, the same types of screens. They'll be understandable. And you can move from one to the other without losing any data. So you can log in with a username and password on the website. You'll, you'll see the transactions in there. You could send your mother uh, you know, five, ten dollars or whatever. Log into the other one on your phone and you'll see the, the transaction pop up. So we, we, want, we want that type of complete uh, streamlined experience throughout the project. This is a sneak peek of some of the mock-ups that I just got two days ago. Uh, this is the, uh, how you would how it would look to create an app, and this the screen here. If you collapse it down, it collapses into what looks like a mobile phone. So you could run this from a mobile phone. You could run it on your your web browser, like really small. Um, uh, here's uh, my accounts, so you'll be able to create accounts and move money around like I was talking about, along with apps. Apps is this concept where a store can create an app, and then this will allow them an identity on our network to do business through. Whereas maybe you have to go to the website to buy uh, socks you know, through, through a, a merchant on there. On, on this, though, however, you, you'll be able to go into apps, search for the SOC provider that you're looking for, and then you, you could actually buy it straight off of here. Or you can see the purchases that are associated with this. You see the descriptions, see what, when, where, why, all of the, the, the information that, that is uh, missing from, from crypto. So I think that's about it. That's Dash Evolution, and that was my presentation.
guys any questions, either Evan or myself would be happy to answer that. So there's, there's a few ways of, of doing Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. Would you mind I'm repeating his question oh. into the, Yes. Uh, so the question was, how do you turn dash into cash? Uh, there's, there's definitely not a, a whole lot of options for that currently. Uh, we're working on fiat gateways in, in some of those, those types of services as we speak, actually. So, you know, if you, if you look in a few months, you'll, you'll probably see a, a brand new way that, that we've been working on for now over a year. Um, I wanted to add to that also because that is also something uh, that actually I have to do on a regular basis. Because um, as I said, I don't have a bank account, and so to pay all my denom dollar dollar denominated dollar denominated dollar denominated uh, expenses, I have to do just as you say because I'm paid in Dash. Um, and something that I'm looking forward to that I hope um, starts to develop like a nice liquidity is. Um, the wallet Mycelium will be adding Dash as their first non-Bitcoin currency, I believe this October. And I, don't, I don't know if you're familiar with the Mycelium wallet, but they have a feature called Local Trader, where you can see who within an X mile radius is buying or selling Dash for cash near you. So that's what I hope to use um, just here in a couple months. Anybody else have a question? Yes, you. Uh, he wants to know how much higher are minor fees for Dash than Bitcoin? Uh, which which type of minor fees are you, are you talking about? I'm talking about five cents money someone else, then Bitcoin takes a tiny amount to pay miners. I think he means transaction. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, so the, the question is uh, how much higher are transactional fees on the Dash blockchain than Bitcoin? And the, the answer is actually cheaper. Uh, our, our fees are pretty low. The, the blockchain is, is uh, not to the point where there's competition yet on the transactional activity, which is actually a pretty good reason to use alternative coins if, if it's possible, because they're probably usually going to be cheaper. And we plan on keeping it that way. We want to use a, a fixed amount of, of uh, transactional fee per transaction. So maybe, maybe a standard like three to five cents or one percent or half a percent or, or something like that. How, uh, going, going back to what you are talking about, um, avoiding the use of, like, using it legally, using it legally, how would you do that uh, without like, someone explicitly saying what they're going to buy or what the service is, right? Mm -hmm. It's just a cash in a sense, right? So, I mean, how, how like, you were trying to avoid that, how would you do that? So the question is, um, how how does one ever even claim like that transaction on that blockchain is an illegal one if it's all just like cryptography? Um, yeah, I mean, it's not something I would ever do, uh, but there do exist people who, for example, uh, accosted a young man named Ross Ulbricht in the library one day, and he had his Bitcoin wallet open. And uh, because people had been, I don't know, like spying or something, um, fast forward to, yes, there was a day in US court when someone said that transaction on that blockchain is illegal. And so um, like in, in the more general sense, there is a technological method called, I don't know, it's called blockchain analysis or like clustering or something where if someone does reveal one of their addresses and like connects it with them in real life, whether they wanted to or not, like, um, then you know, like there are actually companies that are, are starting to try to like sell this information where they're like, we think that address belongs to this person, that address belongs to this person, that address belongs to this person, and here's a graph we made of every transaction we think that they ever made. Whether or not that's true, whether or not that's moral is up in the air, um, but people do do this. Actually, I'd like to add to that a little bit. The, the whole point of having anonymity in, built into the protocol itself is because I see there being a, a profit motive for companies to start 
uh, looking at the blockchain, analyzing it, uh, using machine learning, using graphing technologies, using any of these more advanced uh, technologies, and then selling. And I know, you know no one wants their information sold, so why should we allow it to happen? If we're making something directly for the users, we should make it you know, something that they want. And privacy is important. It's a human right. And so uh, unless you've done something wrong and they can prove that you've done something wrong, they shouldn't be able to go through the transactions and point at you and say, you know, that, that one, we, we want that money. Yeah. And so that, that's really what, what we're trying to stop. Uh, how do you, uh, it sounds like you, there's a way to this blockchain analysis is how is, how is that approach? Uh, so we have, we have a process. It used to be called dark send. It's now called private send, and it's a on on protocol mixing technology that's decentralized, hosted by the master node network. It, essentially, what it does is you you and a, a couple other people get together and you'll each send the same denomination of coin. So let's say the, the, the pool that you're mixing in is a, a one dash pool. And so each of you send you know, two, or three, uh, two or three inputs of, of, of one dash. And now you have, you have uh, a transaction where all of the inputs from all three of you are all one dash. All of the outputs from all three of you are all one dash and then you merge them together and then you do co-signing. And the master node then is just the, it's just the platform for doing this and allowing people to, to do the mixing. The mixing is actually done only using your own wallet. You're sending transactions to yourself and you're just using it as a service. I have a technical question. Uh, I read the number the white paper. What are your thoughts? Do you think it has The, the what white paper? He's asking um, if you've read the Mimble so white paper. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll definitely check it out. Yeah. Um, yes, so um, you said earlier that anybody can become a master node uh, that can have a good currency. Um, do you have any concerns about that could be to a centralization issue where, where the people with the most currency end up? So that's a great question. Uh, that's a great question. The the question was, since it requires a, a thousand dash to become a master node, is there a risk of centralization over long periods of time? Uh, and the there there is a risk, but we're we're mitigating it. the The idea here is called master node shares. So as as the, the technology start, begins to take off, the requiring a thousand dash for a master node is going to put it out of the reach of most investors. But if, if we can break up master nodes into a thousand shares, 10,000 shares, 100,000 shares, then we can start offering something that is akin to interest bearing accounts. What if, what if in the evolution wallet, you could move money into a savings account it would automatically make the masternode shares, uh, publish them using the protocol, and then masternodes would be made on your behalf. You would just get small pieces of, of that total revenue. That puts masternodes in the hands of not just a few thousand people, but the millions, potentially. Uh, I have a question about the DAOs just in general, as far as like technically. So I'm kind of familiar with Ethereum and how you make DAOs and smart contracts, and how do you do that on the Dash side? So the question is, how do you make DAOs in, in Dash? Yeah, like technically, like, what's the difference? The, okay, currently, there, there is no mechanism. The, the DAOs are essentially just agreed upon. And it, it's a, it, essentially, like I, I would say, you know, I'm, I'm running the, the Dash core DAO. Actually, not just me, it's a, a bunch of people. And then there's there's a few more of them, but we're we're really not socializing with those people or doing projects with those people, and so we don't want to be associated with their funding, and so we, we split it off and we call them different DAOs. In the future, there's there's an upgrade called Sentinel coming, 
And that, that is the, the foundation of allowing us to, to make many different types of, of objects. These, these are not really smart contracts like, like you would make with Ethereum, make a DAO or, or something like that. They're, they're um, governance objects. And you can make governance objects, you can make one of a DAO and you could add users to it and then you could um, add other information. It's a, it's a tree structure. So that'll be coming uh, soon. Uh, oh, a quick question about the DAO. Uh, so earlier you talked about, uh, you know, if you do a non nonprofit DAO and it's more efficient, you could very much jeopardize a lot of industries. And um, do you see DAOs coming out that are going to be for profit and not taking that nonprofit approach? I guess. Um, I I don't know if if we'll make a hard line decision of, of what to support. But I, I would say that most likely, most of the DAOs that do core functionality of the network will probably be ran as not-for-profits. So there's really no reason for them to make profit, un unless they don't want to be funded directly by the system, and they, they want their uh, profit to, to be the, the funding mechanism. It, it might be one or the other, you know, I don't think we've decided yet. question is, the masternode voting mechanism seems to be a lot like proof of stake. Have you ever thought about uh, just taking it to the next level and uh, not using proof of work at all? And yes, we've considered that at great lengths. The problem that we found with it is we rely on the proof of work hashes because we're, we're seeding a, a random number generator mechanism across the network using common hashes so that we can get the same listing order. And that's how a lot of the functionality works. The reason why it's secured by that is because nobody can really pick those numbers and it's really hard to generate. But they're, they're known across the whole network, so they're usable in that way. Is it typical for it to take 24 hours The question is, is it typical for it to take 24 hours to pre-mix uh, a number of coins uh, using, using the mixing mechanism? Currently, yes. There's, there's a, a mechanism on the core chain, the core protocol, called uh, private send, and it takes a while to mix because it, it's having to do it in a completely decentralized way and it's having to do it with multiple rounds, as we call them through separate master nodes because they know who you are. And so if you hop multiple, they can't follow the history back. And we, we don't want them exposed to the history of, of these, these mixed transactions. So yes, it's typical, um, but it's, it's not something that will last forever. The, the solution that, that we've come up with is to add a secondary mixing layer on the evolution side where you could actually reach out to a master node uh, using the same type of functionality, but you, you would actually get the coins mixed in just a few seconds. Are you working on a facility to develop atomic swaps between blockchains? Uh, the question is, are you working on atomic swaps between blockchains? And no, not for <laughs> uh, Question for Amanda. Uh, there, when you did your daily decrypt, uh, you, do, you mentioned, uh, I thought it was cool, you mentioned how you actually got funded to advertise for Dash. And uh, then you made a comment about the fact that when you went for a second round, it was inexplicably voted down by the master nodes. And I wondered if you, if you ever found an explanation for that. Because that, that was kind of cryptic. Because you did a good job, and I think the metrics were there in terms of you um, doing what you were asked to do for that funding, and then you went for a second round. Maybe I'm going to um, The question is, um, did I have a, a once upon a time when we did the daily decrypt, uh, my first tryout of the, the, I call it the treasury, that 10% you saw in the slide that is 
voted out to contractors, projects, basically whomever else works for Dash. Um, and so this last December, when I was doing the Daily Decrypt, uh, Pete and I thought maybe Dash would like to advertise on our show, because we took advertisers, and we can apply through their blockchain. Like we can be, like we can apply to be like blockchain employees for these two weeks or a week that we're gonna put them on our show. Um, and it did pass and it, it went really well and I actually never reapplied and was never oh. due. Oh, okay, I think I know what you mean. Okay, yes, um, so about a month and a half ago, um, I guess, no, about two months ago, after uh, we put in the proposal that Dash detailed my show be funded from the Dash Block Reward, um, one element of the proposal, one of like seven elements that were in the pitch, was that a mirror YouTube channel that existed, that that would be deleted. Is that the one you mean? Yes. Okay, okay, yes. And everything in my proposal ended up being popular and awesome and it got funded except uh, this this one element of like the person who was currently running this mirror channel that had a copy of all of the videos was like no I want to keep that up like you're totally not deleting that and yeah and so uh, actually like I communicated with Evan at the time because th like we came up on this thing that didn't exist before like as I said before like blockchains don't compel human action like the most that we can do is incentivize people to do things or not incentivize them to do things and so at Evan's recommendation uh, a separate vote was put up of like okay everyone let's get specific here should this other YouTube channel be deleted or not and like it seems like so it seems like so silly when I'm talking about it now it's like oh this is like a 90 million dollar market cap currency and I'm like no, you need to listen to me about YouTube. We're gonna vote on it. Um, but yes, but the the decision making engine, as I call the governance process, as Evan dubbed, um, it really came through because, like a cryptographically provable majority of stakeholders, said no, <coughs> Amanda. I don't think that that mirror YouTube channel should be deleted. And so there were no, there were no debate, there weren't like long lasting, maybe there were some tears, but like they dry quick because it's a quick voting process. So, yeah. So the question is, how does instant send work in more technical detail? And how does it prevent double spending? The, the master nodes, they, they organize into uh, groups that we call subquorums. A subquorum is essentially a, a group of maybe uh, five to 10 master nodes of 4,000. And they're randomly elected using a uh, proof of work, a proof of work hash. So if you take uh, all 4,000 of the master nodes and you take a very specific block hash and you seed a random number generator and then you organize that list according to, to that, that proof of work hash, you'll get the same ordering on every node across the network. And then the next thing it does is it takes the top 10 nodes and those are your quorum. And so what happens is you'll send the message, it hits those 10 nodes, and then they look at it and they say, did it make it in the memory pool? Is, does it look okay? And, and, and that, type of, that type of analysis. And then they rebroadcast approval or rejection. It takes, uh, six of 10 of them to do what we call a transaction lock. Transaction lock just simply stops you from spending any input associated with that transaction in any other transactional, uh, in any other transaction. So you can either publish that one transaction that you agreed upon and promised to do or nothing. like the, the our in and off ramps using fiat um, are currently limited perhaps uh, there's a site called Exmo okay so there it well yes so I've checked out Exmo it's exmo.com and they just take like non-traditional fiat deposits you know maybe like a bank wire 
or like a Nuteller transfer or a Skrill transfer, some things like that. And, and then you can buy Dash directly that way should you choose to transfer fiat uh, that way, the way Exmo does. Um, an almost even faster and easier way, depending on where you live, depending on what your banking situation is, is to buy Bitcoin first at this point, like be it through Coinbase, if you don't mind that process, or, or like localbitcoins.com. I bet it's popping in Atlanta. Like there are so many ways to get Bitcoins on localbitcoins.com. Um, also, wallofcoins.com is uh, like a nice, relatively private way. And then, and then shapeshift, like just like shapeshifting Bitcoin into Dash. It's, it's pretty simple and easy. Uh, one more question. It's actually two parts. The first question is if the segregated witness technology were to be incorporated into DAG, would that be put up to a master bit of code? And the second part of the question uh, would be would, would that code base come from a Bitcoin or would it come from a Bitcoin? Do you mind um, remembering that question while I add one more bit to answer his? Absolutely. I just, like, yeah. Also, a way to get Dash is to, like, if it's something that you're really interested in, is to, like, apply to work for the Dash blockchain. Also a possibility, just so you know, I actually released a video just today on how anybody can make a treasury proposal to Dash with blockchain. Uh, so the other question was, uh, with Bitcoin and SegWit, uh, do we plan on, on bringing that in? If we do, since it's kind of controversial, would we put it up for a masternode vote? And would it be coming from Bitcoin or Litecoin? Uh, we, we are a Bitcoin-based uh, currency. We actually re-forked from them. We originally forked from Litecoin, but they keep up to date very well. And we, we want to keep really up to date with, with the changes in Bitcoin. And so we, we actually reforked. And we keep, uh, we keep upstream. We keep uh, merging with upstream like constantly, every few months. So it would actually be abnormal for us not to add SegWit. Uh, if the, the network has uh, any, any type of issue with it, it's absolutely going up for a vote. That's really the only network, uh, or this is really the only um, dispute resolving mechanism that we have. Uh, otherwise, it's just one of us saying, you know, what what is going to go for the whole network for a hundred million dollar network? And that doesn't really make very much sense. Um, I have a question. Um, if I had a, a knowledge of cryptocurrency spans about forty eight hours, so. Welcome. <laughs> um, my question is simply: um, looking at this, I understand the transfer aspect of this, but um, dealing with it from for instance, if someone has, you speak about the treasury, right? The treasury. Mm -hmm. If someone has, um, wants to present a project, let's say, for, uh, for instance, I wanted to, let's say, build a building for Marshall Street or something. Okay. Um, is there a way, are you guys going to integrate something in this platform that will allow people to, to move from that perspective, where it's like, you know, like a private equity type, type of thing going on? Let's say, for instance, everybody can collectively vote on this. I like this idea, okay? This person likes this idea. Um, and somehow fund that particular idea. I think that's another aspect that is, um, I'm not gonna say it's missing, it probably hasn't been developed yet, but that's another aspect I think that is, is probably needs um, because if you think about it, um, most banking, okay? Um, most of the time, anytime you're dealing with private equity, syndicated loans, transactions, Brokers, if you're trying to cut out the middleman, I'm trying to figure out if it's the difference if you cut out the middleman here, where people are not going into those doors, going in those doors, making the doors shut on them, well, where they can collect, a few people who can collectively vote and say, hey, you know what, I like this idea, it's a good idea, you know, is there something like, like that? I don't know this sounds kind of old. Currently, we, we take ideas from all over the network and, and try to implement them. There's no like private equity type of uh, investment going on, uh, except from the blockchain directly, which is really private equity. 
in the future, we plan on, on kind of rolling out a, a larger system. Eventually, we won't need all of the money that the blockchain generates as, as revenue for the network to, or investment for the network. And instead of, of building products, we, we might actually start companies. We, we could actually start a company and theoretically, according to the, the lawyers, uh, own it th through a foundation. And the master nodes would actually own it on paper. And, and then as it made money, it, it could distribute some of the earnings back to the master node network. So that gives us kind of a, a neat way of, of reinvesting. Um, this idea that Evan is talking about is also what uh, is the plan to keep net uh, transaction fees as near or at zero as possible. Because, um, so Dash has a maximum coin supply. Uh, it is not infinitely inflationary. And so at some point, the inflation, which is currently incentivizing our network to run it, that will be gone. And so the kind of the run of the mill story that you hear in other networks, which are also not infinitely inflationary, is that um, fees will will have to make up the, uh, the, the void that inflation leaves behind. And so um, as Evan and as other people in his team have talked about recently, it's this um, creation of other revenue wealth generating streams outside of that that will subsidize transaction fees to that that one. Yeah. Are you raising your hand or are you stretching? I, I do have a curiosity question. Um, I guess about six months ago, I guess, uh, Bitfinex stopped trading Dash. Maybe it's longer. But do you guys know anything about why they did that? Or uh, any clue? The question is why do we know, do we know if we, why Bitfinex stopped trading Dash a number of months ago? I know I don't. Uh, we've had some conversations with them and they said the volume was too low. It, it was low for a really long time. Uh, they actually added us during the first peak. If you go look at charts, we, we went to like $15 right after the launch. And you know we've been around now for three years. Right after that $15, they added us. So they're like, ooh, new coin. It's trading a lot. And the volume went to near nothing because we just started working on the, the product and trying to get investors at that point. So, uh, PayPal in the early days was able to grow a critical mass by giving away $10 to each uh, Bitcoin has suffered because no Bitcoin company can do that because even though they would, they would do the expense, they would have a uh, limited benefit. Dollar to you to another wallet or, or something. So I was getting the benefit. So it sounds like that with your project funding, there's a potential if the stakeholders decide it's a good idea to grow the user base that you can give away that to, to new users. Okay, am I reading that correctly as a potential use or, or no? So the question is, with PayPal in the early days, they were able to incentivize people to, to join and gain mass adoption by giving away $10. And do we plan on doing something similar to that with, with our model? Not do you plan, but does, does your model support it? Oh, not, not the do we plan it, but does the model support it? The model completely supports it. As, as the network begins to grow, we'll, we'll actually have extra money. One of the early plans was to um, incentivize merchants because really, uh, with PayPal, they were going after users. They're, they weren't really going after merchants because you could spend it on eBay, right? So we have, we have to first find a way to spend it. And so why not, you know, for, for anybody that, that joins and uh, is in the top 10 list of merchants for that, that month, we give them like $500 or something. Like, who knows? But the model surely supports that for sure. Be the last question. This will be the last question. So yeah, I was just curious, what is the largest proposal that's passed? Are the largest and the most interesting? Mm. Uh, well, you've been around since the beginning. I mean, I know about everything that's happened in the last year, but uh, the large er, the question is, what is the largest or most interesting proposal that has passed? Uh, we've essentially funded everything that's happened. So uh, conventions, airfare, 
uh, the, the swag that we have, the soda machine. The soda machine's a great one. Uh, we've, we've taken a soda machine uh, to, to multiple places, Florida and California, and the soda machine supports instant transactions. And we actually built that with a proposal as well. And so, pretty good example. Thank you, Wayne. All right, that's it. Thank you, everybody. If anybody wants, uh, as, as Evan mentioned, there is like free like stickers and bags and over there, also there are some t-shirts for sale. If you want any of that, migrate on over. And thank you so much for having us. <laughs>